put in my heart. Do not murder. And in the end, that molecule winds up determining whether they did or they didn't. Hello. Oh, the wonderful iron. Now, here's something for you atheists to think about. Do you know when the DNA molecule was first discovered? Hi, Chris. It was 1869. Before that, mankind had no knowledge. Um, and put this on. But realize I should Yeah, we are waiting for the others. Actually, we are on. Oh, yeah. yeah. 1828. Hello. Can see guys are joining. Um, I'm holding on so that we can all join at least uh, five of us maybe. And we should be starting in just a bit. Uh, huh. Maybe in about two or three, five minutes uh, at most, we will have uh, the other guys join us and then we, we should be starting. Um, just a minute. Let me tell the other guys that we are on. Otherwise, my day has been okay. I've uh, been having a good time today, just uh, relaxing, doing work, and also uh, reading the Bible. I was able to learn quite a number of things. Actually, today I was studying about, um, I studied the story of uh, Zakio, Zacchaeus. Is that what you call him? Zacchaeus, yes. Study the story of Zacchaeus and it was really inspiring considering uh, this is a story that we have had over and over again, and we have never really understood uh, what actually it means. But when you look at the story of Zacchaeus, and I just posted uh, the story on my Facebook, I think, it explains to us how people can be saved. You see, Zacchaeus was this kind of guy who was... Um, he was just normal person doing normal things. And um, when he heard that Jesus was passing around, he had the thirst, he had that desire to go and, uh, and uh, see him and hear from him. That's a good evidence of uh, a good example of how we should also have a desire to, to know the things of God. You know, unless you have the desire of, of the things of God, there's there's no way Jesus is just going to come to your home when you don't have a desire. So Zacchaeus had the desire of hearing from Jesus and to hear what is he telling people. So he had the desire of the word of God. So he went to seek him. And uh, when he went to seek him, the second thing, it shows that the moment you start seeking uh, Christ, he will definitely avail himself. 
So Zacchaeus, after seeking uh, Jesus, then Jesus looks at him and he tells him, today I will dine uh, at your home. So what happens is that um, Jesus goes to, to his home. And uh, when he was there, I don't know what Jesus told Zacchaeus, but uh, the funny thing about the whole thing is that Zacchaeus was, uh, you know, after having heard and understood how Jesus was and uh, the intentions that he had for him, he said that uh, then I would rather not love the money or love something which I really adore because what you love most becomes your idol, becomes your God. So if you love money too much, then that becomes your God. If you love maybe a, even your work so much, then it becomes your God. Whatever that you love so much is exactly what becomes your God. So according to, to him, to Zacchaeus, his God was money. And uh, he was, uh, and uh, what happened is that he said that half of my wealth I'm going to give to the poor. Now, why was he saying that half of the wealth is going to give to the poor? It's because he decided that I just don't want to put all my trust in something. I want to put my trust to show that I can put my trust in the living God and not in these idols and the things that I've, uh, I look forth about. So when he, he said, I'll give half of my wealth to the, the poor, then the next thing that he said was what? And even anyone who have taken his money or her money, I am going as well, likewise, I'm going to give them, I think, four times. And after that, Jesus said that salvation has now entered this home. Why did salvation enter the home of Zacchaeus just like that? It entered the home of Zacchaeus because uh, what exactly happened is he had a change of mind. He changed his mind from what he trusted on and said that I will trust in Jesus Christ and I will put my trust in him, not in just any other thing. And that's how we are able to see salvation is very easy. It's all about a change of mind. Repentance is a change of mind. Change your mind from these things to these things. Change your mind from what you believe before to you know, believing in Jesus Christ from unbelief to belief. And that's a very good story explained to us because this guy did not have time to go to the church. He did not have time to go and give offerings, time to maybe sing a chorus or repeat some, you know, prayer. It was all about change of mind. And that was it. So he changed his mind from what he used to believe mm, and, and so forth. So, uh, I'm still waiting for the others. Still waiting for the others to join with us, and then we can be able to uh, check on this topic of uh, of the importance of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the blood is quite important, and today I'll be speaking about the same, and also. I'll have the recording of this uh, video so that uh, other people can also uh, be able to uh, go through the same and be able to understand, all right? Be able to understand. So maybe we can give uh, maybe two or three minutes. Let me see what time it is, yeah. Maybe one more minute and then I'll be starting off. Uh huh. And I think uh, today we'll be speaking a lot concerning the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has a lot of uh, story concerning the blood atonement. Um, there's a lot of uh, viewpoint that we can uh, learn from in the book of Hebrews. Uh huh. So now, I think uh, we'll be able to start. Uh, we can start. Before we start, we can say our word of prayer. Lord, we come before you this time. We thank you for this a great time that you've given unto us. Oh Lord, we worship you and we honor your name. Bless us as we start this Bible study. Speak to us, O oh Lord, and speak to those who will listen. We thank you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we do pray and we believe. Amen. So now, uh, with always too much time, let me just go straight to the, the point. So 
the importance of the blood of Jesus. So the blood of Jesus is quite important. Most people have never realized how important it is. And I'll give you a good example from uh, the time we had, um, what's it called? When God created the, the, the earth and uh, he put uh, two people there, Adam and Eve. So when Adam and Eve sinned, something happened. They died. They died spiritually. Now, when they died uh, spiritually, then there were also that spiritual death also had to affect, would be able to affect the natural, okay? So now what happened is that when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing which God did was to kill an animal. God himself, he gave the first example of the blood, the importance of the blood. He shed the blood of an animal and clothed Adam and Eve. Because uh, without clothing Adam and Eve, then it would have meant they would have been naked all through. So God is the first one who clothed. And basically clothing them was a representation of clothing sin. Now, I want to make you understand the importance of the blood of Jesus. So now, when God clothed Adam and Eve uh, using the killing an animal and shedding the blood, then that was the first time that we see the blood shed. And after that, we see also the sequence goes on and on and on. We see uh, Cain and Abel, they went and they did, uh, you know, they were giving sacrifice to God and Abel sacrificed, shed blood and God accepted the, the blood. But Cain did not sacrifice, did not uh, sacrifice by shedding of blood. He gave his, you know, the wax, the labor of his, uh, of his farm. He gave his watermelon, he gave his oranges, he gave whatever he was giving. Yeah? And uh, when he gave that, God did not accept. That one basically explains to us how much God does not like our works. You see, the Bible tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags unto God. No matter how much righteous we may seem, no matter how good you have been, we go to church Sunday every morning. We don't. We give to the poor. We are really good. We don't abuse others. We don't kill others. We are, we help the needy. We do all that. God still calls it garbage. You know, He says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Why? Because we can only enter heaven through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is no way we can be able to save ourselves by our own righteousness. So that's why when uh, Cain gave God his works, okay, he sacrificed to God the, the labor of his farm, then God did not accept. He only accepted blood. Then you'll ask yourself, why was God accepting blood? Because the Bible tells us in Leviticus eleven seventeen that the life of the flesh is in the blood. We can, we can go there. Leviticus. Uh, 11, 17. Let me show you this. This is really, really powerful. Leviticus 11, 17. Uh, at, yes, yes, yes. 11, verse 17. No, actually 17 verses 11. Sorry, I always confuse the two. 17, 11. It says, <clears throat> for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So what is an atonement? Atonement is to make at one, basically at one meant. So for you to be made at one with God, because you are already separated from God, there needs to be blood. That, then now why blood? Why the, that blood? Why should there be blood for you to be made at one with God? It is because of one simple thing. Whoever sins must die. So the life of the flesh being in the blood, it means when you take out the blood from any flesh, then you're taking out the, the, the life. That's why when uh, somebody is, uh, maybe has gotten an accident, the first thing that you do is to make sure that that person has enough blood. Why? Because the life of that flesh is in the blood. So you have to make sure that the blood is there in the body. So for that person to survive. So where there is sin, there must be shedding of blood. That is very, very true. And uh, you, have to, you have to definitely understand that the blood is important. So now, as we continue the story of what happened, Cain and Abel, Abel gives the blood, God accepts. Cain 
is not accepted. Then we continue over and over. We see other different people, even after the time of Noah, we see even at the time of Abraham, there's sacrifice, the blood, the blood. Then now we come to the Ten Commandments. Now Moses was given the Ten Commandments. He was told by God that uh, whoever does something wrong or whoever sins, there must be something that is sacrificed. You have to sacrifice an animal, a lamb, okay? Just go and pick a lamb, the one which is so pretty, so young, so innocent, go and pick that one. Is the one that you're going to sacrifice. Don't pick the, the ones which are really already dead, others are crippled. No, pick the one which is, you see that the way you see that lamb is really, uh, is really so much innocent, looking so pure. Now, that lamb is the one that God wanted uh, the, the children of Israel to sacrifice. Why? The way you will feel that pain seeing an innocent lamb, which is so pure, being killed for nothing, just to sacrifice for a sin, it shows how much God feels whenever he sees you doing something wrong. And you're the one who is supposed to be sacrificed. You're the one who is supposed to be sacrificed. But God looks and tells you, okay, I'm going to give you something else. I will allow that uh, lamb to be sacrificed instead of you. And you see, what they used to do is that in the Old Testament, uh, Moses was told um, they should put uh, a lamb like this. The, the, you know, you, you come to the altar with the lamb and then you hold the lamb on the neck here. Okay, you yourself, the sinner, the person who has sinned. Then after you hold it like this, the next thing that you do is you cut the throat of that lamb. And as the blood is oozing out from the throat of that lamb, then now the, the priest will come with a basin or an, uh, maybe some, 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 something to, you know, to, to put in the blood. And they will tap the blood from that, uh, the throat of that lamb. And they will go with that blood and sprinkle it in the altar and sprinkle it in the other, in the other things in the, uh, in, in the church. At the, as it was explained, uh, as uh, it was instructed in the Bible. So the main thing here is uh, what people used to trust is not this lamp for the forgiveness of sins. It is the blood which was shed by that lamp is the one which they trusted. And they said, because God has given a command and he has said, this blood which is being shed by this lamp is the one that I'm trusting then because God has given that rule that there has to be blood shed, then it means this blood which has been shed, it has been shed for my sin, okay? It has been shed for my sin. So it means it was supposed to be my life which is coming out from, that, uh, from the flesh, but it is the life of this lamb which is coming out. So this blood is the one that I'm trusting for the remission of my sins, okay? So that's exactly what they used to believe. And uh, it went over and over and over. But now the problem was the blood of goats, rams, cows, you know, bulls and all those was only forgiving sins to a certain period. So if you have sinned for the whole of this week and then you go at the end of the week and sacrifice a, a lamb, you'll be forgiven the whole, the sins from now and past. But now it could not forgive you the future sins and sins over and over again because it was not that powerful. So then God looked when he was in heaven and he said, these people every week, every month, every year, they're sacrificing all the time, all the time because they are full of sins. What am I going to do? These people are full of mistakes and I need to do something. I need to give them a sacrifice which they will not need to uh, to do sacrifices over and over again. And that's when God sent Jesus Christ to come. And when he was coming, we see something uh, which happened. When Jesus was, was coming for baptism, to be baptized, uh, there's something which happened. Let's go and see in the book of John 1.29. John 1.29. Uh, John 1.29 is... Uh, when Jesus was coming to be baptized, the Bible says, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and says, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Why was John the Baptist calling Jesus the Lamb of God? 
It is because he was coming now to be the sacrificial lamb. You remember all through the Old Testament, there were lambs which are, which are being sacrificed, innocent, the very fine, the very innocent, the very uh, clean and neat, no blemish and everything, okay? That lamb which had no mistakes is the one which used to be sacrificed back then. And Jesus now came as the lamb of God without blemish, without sin, very innocent, and was to be sacrificed for the sin of the world. I don't know if you're getting the point. So now that's why we see John the Baptist saying, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now this new lamb, the lamb of God was coming to take away the sin of the world away completely. It was not doing only remission of sins because remission means it will go and then it will come back. When somebody has cancer, we say, uh, and he has gone for chemotherapy, we say that the cancer is on remission, okay? Uh, remission means it has gone for a period of time, then it will come back again. But now when Jesus comes, he took away the sin of the world. So there was no more sin. There is no more sin. So now if there is no more sin, then why do we see people going to hell? It is because of one thing. They never trusted that that blood which was being shed was shed for them. The moment you trust that Jesus shed his blood for you, then you become saved and you will not go to hell. The same way these people in the Old Testament used to trust that the blood of the lamb, which they are sacrificing at the altar, that blood was for, for the forgiveness of their sins. That is the same, same way that right now we have to believe that the blood which is being shed, it is for the remission of our sins and also for taking away all our sins through, uh, the, uh, through the power of Jesus Christ. Right now we get redemption, okay? Jesus redeemed us from our sins. Now, redeeming means what? He took away the sin. He took away the sin from us, okay? And now all that you needed to do is just to trust and believe that he did that for you. And the moment you believe that he did that for you, then you get saved. And there's no way you're going to hell, okay? So, as I continue, I want to tell you a, a little bit about why you'll be judged so much for not believing uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's go to G Hebrews 10, 28. Hebrews 10, 28. Uh, Hebrews 10, 28, it says... He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, these are the people who despised Moses' law, the Ten Commandments, the, I mean, the, the, the Old Testament law. Those who despised, they died without mercy, okay, under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment, suppose ye, shall, be, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despise unto the spirit of grace. So if those who despise the blood of the covenant that time with Moses, they, they were judged harshly. How much more harshly do you think you're going to be judged if you, 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 you just say the blood of Jesus is of no use? This is especially explained to the people who say, you see, there's something else that you can do apart from the blood and be saved. You see, people try to make you, don't believe the blood. Come on, just say a few sentences. Just say this and that. Just do this and that. You know, when you're baptized, when you're doing this, come on. Catholic, they say when you're baptized, you'll get saved. Uh, the other people who say when you give your tithes, you'll be saved. There are those uh, who say when you do good to the poor, you'll be saved. The others who say, just repeat this sinner's prayer, you will be saved. Now, these are things that you do, you have to do. But the Bible has nothing about something that you have to do. It has everything to do with you believing the gospel. The gospel is what? That the blood which was shed by Jesus Christ, it was shed for you. Jesus died for our sins, was buried was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So if Jesus died for your sins, and uh, it explains how he died, it was by shedding his blood, then it means 
if you don't believe in that blood, then there's nothing you're doing. You're only believing in your works. So if you say that um, uh, maybe I did something good, I, I, I helped the poor, I helped the needy, I helped the stranger, I was um, a church goer 24 seven, I said this prayer, I was baptized, I, 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 I did it. You see, all those are good things. They're purely very good things, but that is not what gives us salvation. You see, salvation is a very unique thing. It's all about trusting. If I tell you, uh, I've, I've already paid your, your, your ticket to Mombasa, let's say, for example, just go to the airport. I've already given all your details there. Go and talk to them and tell them that uh, you are so-and-so who Keith paid your ticket to Mombasa. And when you tell them that, they are going to, you know, they already have your details there. Actually, the camera will see you and it will say, oh, yeah, that person should go. And you keep on saying, no, I don't, I don't believe that you have paid for me. I don't believe this. I don't know if, I don't know if you have done it for me. And I, I don't know. M maybe I can walk. Maybe I can go. Uh, like, like I, can, I can go, you know, hide myself and get into the plane. You see, you'll be using other, other ways which are not true. Yes, fine. You can use those rods. But do you think you're going to enter the next airport the right way? No, unless you're a stowaway, okay? Unless you've just, you're hiding yourself, of which means when the police will get you, then you'll be jailed and you'll be said you're an uh, in, in, intruder or you got into the plane in the wrong way. That's the same way. People, instead of going to, uh, to, to, to Christ the right way, they think that I'll have to use other styles. I'll have to use you know, doing good works, doing this and that, doing this, which is really okay. But there's no way you can get salvation unless through believing, unless through trusting. You need to go and say, okay, I have heard that Jesus died for me. And uh, I've read and I've understood that for sure he did this for me. Then when you understand that and you accept it from your heart, then that's how you're saved. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is, okay? So salvation is not about what you do. It is basically about what Jesus did. There's something that Jesus did and he wants you to trust in what he did and not in what you are doing. Because if you trust in yourself, then there's, 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 there was no need for Jesus doing it. If, if, if you can go to heaven through your own works, then why did Jesus have to die? Why do you have to trust in Jesus and what he did? You see, you go to heaven through the righteousness of Jesus. You cannot go through your own righteousness. There's no way you can go to heaven by the things that you've done, how good you are, what you've done. You see, I was here, I did this. Everything that you want to do, the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that our righteousness is filthy rags unto God. He will not even accept you, but he'll only accept because you have been endorsed by Jesus Christ. In short, let me use that word. Jesus has said, okay, that person, let him come because I, I have, I've done something for him. I've given him my robe. I've given him my clothes. I've given him my righteousness. Let him come in. But if you say, oh, I've gone and taken a shower. I am good. I'm clean now. God, can you accept me? He will not accept you. It is only through the blood which was shed by Jesus that you can be able to be saved. In the Hebrews 9, 11, Hebrews 9, 11, it says, mm, but Christ being come as an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of gods, now this is what I was saying, neither by the blood of gods and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, Jesus did not save us through the blood of cows and goats and lambs and all that. He saved us by his own blood, which he entered once into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption. You remember I was telling you that Jesus did not only bring us a remission of sins, but he gave us redemption. He redeemed us from our sin. And that's why John the Baptist was saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away, who redeems the sin of the world, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if I've taken away your sin and you don't trust if I've done it, 
then you will die in your sins. If Jesus has already taken away your sin, right now he already died and for everyone, Jesus is not going to die again for someone. If you sin, he's not going to die again for you. What he did, he did once and for all. He forgave you once. He forgave Hitler. He forgave every person, every evil person that you ever know. He's already forgiven. The only problem is that people don't trust that they were forgiven. They keep on saying, no, there's another way that I can come to God. There's another way that I can do this. There's another way that I can. And you keep on lying to yourself. And that's how you will never know the benefit of the blood of Jesus and how he redeemed you using his blood. Okay. So the blood is really, really important for the remission of sins. It's really, really important. Okay. So all other sacrifices were only for remission. But this blood of Jesus was for the past, present, and future sins, okay? Let's go to Colossians 1.14. Colossians 1.14, it says, In whom we have redemption, hear this, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption through the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of sins. So he redeems us. He redeems us from what? From our vile bodies, from the evil of this world. He redeems us. Redeeming is, is like picking us up. He redeems us up. He, he, he changes us. He takes us away from the evil of the world. He will redeem you on that day. He will, he will be with you and change you. Why? Because he does it through the blood, the blood that he shed on the cross. He was the lamb. And that's why the blood is really, really important for our salvation. And the Bible tells us very well, in the last days, people will have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So where is the power? The power is found in the blood. There is power in the blood. We always sang that there is power in the blood of Jesus. Why did you have to sing that? Because the, the power is in the blood. But people don't want the issue of the blood. They want anything else apart from the blood. Do this, do that, give that, do that, enter here, do that, go and wash your, here, yourself here, go and do this. So it's all about do, 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 do things that you have to do. But the Bible is very clear, very dogmatic about this. It says it's nothing to do with doing. It's all about you believing, you believing, okay? When you believe, you shall be saved, okay? So uh, let's see also Ephesians 1.7. Ephesians 1.7, just also says something here. In whom we have redemption through his blood. We have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace we have redemption through what his blood so we are not redeemed by any other thing but we are redeemed by his blood okay so unless you can be able to understand that you are redeemed by the blood of jesus christ i don't know what else you can be able to believe and you can be able to trust and and uh, and uh, help yourself okay so you have to believe in the blood of jesus christ for the remission of sins and uh, still there be, 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 uh, just behind there in ephesians 2 uh, 8 9 it says uh ephesians 2 8 9 just uh i think just in chapter 2 eh? 8 9 it says for by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god you're not saved by yourself you're not saved by the things that you do. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. It is a free gift. So if you find yourself buying salvation, buying blessings, buying, uh, you know, God's favor, then that's not a true salvation because salvation is a free gift. Everything from God is free. The Bible says freely you are given, freely give. So for anyone who sells to you salvation, sells to you oil, sells to you water, sells to you this and that, for, this, for the purposes of connecting you to God, then he's lying to you because nothing of God is for sale. Everything is free. He was given freely. Now, where did you ever see Jesus selling water, selling anointing oil, selling t-shirts, selling this and that? There's no place, not even one apostle of Jesus Christ, we see any evidence in the Bible selling anything. 
But today, modern uh, church, uh, ch church leaders, they are selling so many things. They want to sell salvation. Why would someone sell salvation to you? It is unless they are very false and they are lying to you. So don't let anyone sell to you anything. Salvation is free for by grace you are saved through faith. Faith alone. What is faith? Faith is believing, trusting, faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift, a free gift, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is not of works. You see, others, they think because, uh, you see, my salvation, I have, there's something that I need to do. There's something, need, there's nothing that you need to do. Salvation is free. And then when you are saved, because God says he will give us a new mind and a new heart. The moment we believe, we, he will give us a new mind and a new heart. When you have a new mind and a new heart, you're not going to do things the way you used to do them before. The other time before you are saved, you are heartless. You could kill someone. You could cane someone for nothing. You could steal and abuse people. But now you have a changed heart. You have a changed mind. So what are they going? Uh, what results are we going to see? We're going to see a different result. We're going to see different works. The way you used to do things, we're going to see good works now. Good works of salvation. Good works of preaching to people. Good works of doing good things to people. And that's why in verse 10 it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are his workmanship. So he has made us his workman. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's people you know, workers, we are his workers. Workers how? We are going to be working for him. And he tells us that we are his workmanship unto good works, okay? Which God has before ordained that we can work in them, okay? Very important and very, very much easy, okay? So when you hear that, uh, Jacinta, you can put, you can put, okay. Okay. let me, Jacinta, please put on your, put off your microphone, okay, great, so we are created unto good works, so salvation is a free gift, very, very free, let no one sell you salvation, because the Bible tells us it is a free gift, free, 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 100%, so let's continue with the blood of Jesus. Now, Romans 3.25, it says, it tells us something here. Romans 3.25, it tells us, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. All right? Let me, let me just uh, start in verse 23. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. Everyone has sinned. So for those who say, no, I've never sinned. I've never done this. Then they're lying to themselves. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely. Now, how are we justified? Justify, justified means just if I'd, you know, it's like the, the Bible is telling you, when you're justified, you become as if you have not even sinned, just as if I had not sinned, as if I had not done those things, okay? So you're being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So Jesus has some redemption. And that redemption is what justifies you freely. There's nothing you need to pay. There's no amount of money that you need to pay to be justified by Jesus Christ. There's nothing that you need. The only thing that you need to, um, to understand here is the blood and why it is important for you. So verse 25 says, whom God has set forth He's talking about Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So he has become our propitiation. Propitiation is a substitute. We were supposed to, you know, we were supposed to die in our sins, but Jesus took those sins and buried them when he went down at his burial you know, at, a, at, a, at the grave. He, he became the unleavened bread. He took our sins and took with them, uh, them with him into the ground. And when he rose up, he rose up new. And uh, the Bible tells us that we died with Christ and rose with him. So right now we are new again. We are born again. The moment we trust that Jesus died and he rose again for our sins, 
he shed his blood for our sins, then that means we have understood and we have accepted that whatever he did and he rose again, we also did it with him. So we died with him and we rose with him. And through his blood, we were cleansed off our sins. Like I said, blood is an essential thing uh, when it comes to salvation, all right? So Romans 5.11, it tells us something here, 5.11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, through Jesus, we have received the atonement. We have been atoned. We have received, uh, what is atonement? We have been made to be at one with God. Before we were separated with God, sin separated us from God. And then he said that whosoever sins, he must die. And the Bible tells us in Leviticus 17, 11, like I've read before, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So if the life of the flesh is in the blood, then when you sin, then the blood has to come out. So when the blood comes out, it means you have died. But then God gave substitute over and over again of how we can use other bloods of lambs and goats and animals and bulls to try and kill them and remove their blood for the remission of sins. But it could not be possible for the people to go to heaven. So God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, to come and be the lamb and shed his blood for you. Shed his life for you. Give his life for you, which the life is in the blood. So this blood is the one which was able to cleanse you of your sins. And through the death of Jesus Christ, through shedding of his blood, we were able to be saved. So what is the gospel? The gospel is basically what Jesus did. Understanding what Jesus did and you understand it and you believe it. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news of Jesus, what he did for us. So the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And it talks about how, 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 what really happened? How did it happen? What Jesus did on that day? So it says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So the Apostle Paul is saying, this is the gospel which I'm declaring to you, which I preached unto you, which you received and wherein you stand. So this gospel is what I preached unto you. I'm not giving you another gospel. I'm giving you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you received, okay, and wherein you stand, and by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. So he's telling you, Keep in memory what happened. Keep in memory this gospel. Don't let it depart away from you. That's why the Bible says, I've written you, my laws into your hearts and your mind, and I don't want it to depart from you. Don't let the laws of God depart from you. Why? Because the moment the law of God departs from you, it means then you have not even understood it in the first place. Because as much as I know, you cannot lose your salvation. For those who say they have lost their salvation, it means that they first had not even understood the salvation. You see, you have to hear and understand. And he continues there in verse 3. Uh, For I deliver unto you first of all that which also received, how that Christ died for our sins. So how did Jesus die? He shed his blood. And through the shedding of that blood, we were able to be redeemed of our sins. He shed that blood. He died on the cross. That blood was, was supposed to be your blood, which was being shed. But he did it for you. So that if you believe in this, then you will not perish, but you'll have eternal life. If you believe that Jesus died and he shed his blood for you, then that blood redeemed you of your sins. Okay. So that's really how that Christ died. So it continues, how that Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. He did not die for nothing, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. He took the sins with him to the grave and became the unleavened bread and took the sins down there. He was buried. And that he rose again. He rose by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came in him and he rose him up, according to the scriptures. The scriptures were inspired by God the Father. So if you believe the scriptures, then you believe God the Father. And this is the whole gospel. The whole gospel is all about how Jesus died and why he died. 
he died for you. So when you understand this, then it means you've gotten saved. The blood is really, really important. The blood is really, really important. Let me just uh, check maybe uh, there is one more. Um, there, there are two more verses which I want to show you. In the book of Acts 2028, 20, Acts 2028, 20, there's something which Paul was saying, 2028. He's saying, take heed. This one he was talking to the, uh, the, the church leaders. He's telling them, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. So Paul is saying, take heed and take care of this flock, which the Holy Ghost has given unto you to take care for, okay? Uh, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the, the, uh, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So he's saying, we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. God, Jesus being God, he purchased us with his own blood. So he's telling the, uh, the, the pastors and every other person, please, Take it. Do not lead them astray. Don't lead this flock astray. Don't tell them there's another way for you to be saved. Don't tell them that you can do this to be saved. Don't tell them that you can give to the poor to be saved. Don't tell them that you can be baptized to be saved. Take heed because he bought them with his blood. He shed his blood and that blood is the one which purchased this church. He purchased it with his own blood. So take heed. And the final thing that I want to tell you is uh, in Acts 2024, 20, Acts 20, uh, 24, just up there, it's saying, none of these things move me. Neither, this is Paul saying, none of these things move me. Neither I count my, uh, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace of God. So Paul is saying, there's nothing which makes sense to me. Everything else is vanity. I don't care about this. I don't care about what. I don't care about what. All I care about is to make sure I finish my work very well and I testify the gospel of the grace of God. And he continues, verse 25. And now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Paul is saying, I know I've preached so much, but you guys, you may not see me again. Why? Because Paul was about to go and be jailed and uh, you know the story how it goes. You can go and check the story of Paul. But then he gives them a warning. He, he, he tells them in verse 26, wherefore I take to you record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. I know I've preached the real truth. I've said the real truth, which is in the blood of Jesus Christ. I've said this is the true gospel. Everybody, please be saved through believing in the blood. And he says, I know because I've said that I am pure of the blood of any man. Because what does this have to teach us? If you lead other people astray, telling them a false gospel, then the blood of those people will be counted unto you. In the, the book of Ezekiel 31, it tells us that you are God's watchman. And if you see the sword coming and you don't tell people so that they can prepare and run away and hide themselves, if those, that sword comes and kills the people and they have not prepared themselves, the, the blood of those people will be counted unto you. If you see something wrong, you see a false doctrine in the church. You see somebody telling people a wrong doctrine and you don't tell them, hey, please, this is wrong. Come on, you, you person who is saying this, you're saying something wrong. And you, you are deceived. If you don't tell them, and the sword comes, because the sword is coming, the day of the wrath of God is coming, and you don't tell them, and those people just go astray, and they, they, they die in their sins and go to hell, their blood will be counted on you. So don't let the blood of these people be counted on you. Tell people the truth. Tell people what they need to do to be saved and is believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for their sins, okay? So Paul is saying, I know I'm pure from the blood of all these men because I told them the truth that Jesus saves his blood through his blood, believing in his blood. And he says, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, and then, of course, he repeats what I've just said. Take it, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock 
over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And then verse 29, he says this, for I know this, this is Paul saying, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The other wolves who will just come, the false teachers who will come pretending to be so good and they want to lead the flock astray. They tell them, say this sinner's prayer, give to the poor, give tithe, give, go and get baptized. These are things that will get you saved. Hey, you, you come to church 24 seven so that you can be saved. These are good things, but they don't give you salvation. Salvation is only found in the blood of Jesus Christ. So these wolves will come and they will tell people, this is how you'll be saved and which is not true. And if you see people, you know, giving you this false uh, salvation, please run away, run away, run as much as you could ever do because you're gambling with your soul. You're gambling with your life. You're gambling with your life. So don't worry about what people will say. Just focus and listen to what the Bible says. It's saying, so let's, let's continue there. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. These are false prophets who will be speaking perverse things, lies, hypo hypocrites, to draw disciples unto them. Hey, you see, I am the best of the best. This is what, what, what I did this, holy water, holy water, holy oil. I did this. I was in the mountain 40 days. So believe in me, I am good. You see, even before there's a place where Paul says, did Paul die for you? Did Apollos die for you? Then why the division? If it's all about Jesus, then raise Jesus alone. Stop telling other people that you see, I, I'm good in this, I'm good in that. No, it's all about what Jesus did, okay? And verse 30 is saying, also for your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is Apostle Paul says, guys, remember, Every day I want you with tears. And I told you, please, please, please listen to the truth. The truth is found in the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. Don't, the truth is not found in all these people who give you many, many stories of how good they are and how anointed they are and what they have done, giving their CV more than the CV of Jesus. You should avoid such kind of people. I never cease to warn you day and night with tears. It means Paul was really working is much hard and he sees some people believing in other things and he just cries and tells them oh please who will save you from this deception and the same deception is happening nowadays people have been taken to another gospel they are believing in another salvation another thing that they cannot be able to know what they are doing please believe the gospel don't be taken astray by people who are only after their own ways and after their own things Hope it was a blessing. God bless you. Have a blessed time. Maybe we can just finish with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this Bible study. Let everyone who hears this word be blessed. We thank you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.